Okay, so, sorry. Uh, so I'll turn it over. Let's enjoy. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm the Okay. Thank you. So I, uh, I promised myself that I would give a wise talk at some point during my, my time at Cengage. And since my last day is Friday, this is really the, the last opportunity to, uh, to, to do that. So uh, thank you guys for, for taking the hour to, to listen. And, and I hope that, um, that this can be beneficial to everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about how uh, I and the Ponies team uh, test drive the development process for our express middleware and I'll show you how we structure and organize our server-side code in order to do so. Uh, now, I, I assumed when I signed up to give this talk that this was going to be a relatively safe topic of conversation, but in the past two weeks, I've, I've discovered that there's actually been a lot of uh, chatter and debate about this pattern. And uh, while in general, it seems like most of the people on the team who have worked with it are pretty happy with it, uh, there are some differences of opinion about whether or not it goes far enough uh, or whether in some areas um, we might take a different approach. And um, I can tell you, uh, as some of you know, in a prior career path, I was a, a practicing litigator. And in that line of work, I was forced to stand up and speak in front of people whose express job it was to, to judge uh, my performance. And... I can confidently say that uh, that this is more intimidating to be speaking in front of a, a group of really highly uh, intelligent and passionate and capable engineers about a set of controversial topics such as test-driven development and tier architecture in Node.js applications. Uh, and I'm comparing this to experiences in which when I screwed up, my clients went to jail. So this is, this is an experience for me. Uh, but one thing that I did learn from all of that is the power of debate. And uh, so I'm hoping that at the very least uh, we can explore the approach that I've taken and uh, that that can lead to a series of useful discussions and that uh, the teams here at Cengage can, uh, can improve their development practices and, and that um, our ability to deliver quality software will improve as a result of this talk. So we have... Uh, the WebEx, is it is it not working? Because I just advanced my... Did you advance? Yeah. Okay. I'm on the next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. Sure. Good. Uh, so we have an hour, and um, while well, I'd love to jump straight into the pattern, my... Uh, experience is that it would help us to do some preliminary work uh, before we get there. So here's the agenda in seven parts. The first thing that I want to cover is I want to kind of dispel some myths about express middleware and what it is and, and what it isn't and, and why it's called middleware because I think uh, it, at least for me that kind of was elusive for a while and, and it may be to, to others. Uh, I also want to talk about the philosophy behind testing behavior understanding that we've had a number of uh, wise talks and other conversations around the floor uh, about uh, what is behavior and what is implementation and, and kind of how to, to draw that distinction. But I think it's important to at least kind of review that for, for maybe a minute or two uh, before I talk about why express middleware is, is behavior and needs to be tested uh, at the unit level, at least in my opinion. So I'll also make that argument. Uh, Next, we'll talk about some of the challenges that our team and others have faced when unit testing uh, express middleware, and we'll look at examples of, uh, of what those challenges are, and we'll kind of talk about that together. And in the final stage of preparatory work, I just want to do a little review of uh, promises uh, with the Q library, because uh, I think there's some nuances there uh, that it's important that we refresh ourselves on. Uh, and then we can uh, get into building up uh, the pattern that the Pony team is using uh, to organize our applications for really for organization and readability and also for, for, for testability. Uh, and then finally, I'll try to answer some of your questions. So uh, 
I put this slide early in the deck because uh, if you saw it after you finished eating, it becomes a little bit less interesting. <laughs> um, but uh, the sandwich analogy is actually a good, good one for, uh, for express middleware, and, and, and we'll see, see why in a moment. This is a simple case uh, for structuring an endpoint in Express and for, for building middleware with Express. And um, I think most people who start out with Express think of their routes and their controllers and their middleware as really just multiple labels for the same thing. And that may or may not be good enough for your purposes, depending on kind of where you are in your process of using Express. In this simple example, we can see why that's uh, a tempting thing to do. In these three lines of code, one of which is a mere closing brace, closing parenthesis, and, and semicolon, uh, we've actually defined a root middleware and, and controller logic. Uh, and if that's as far as you ever get in Express, you'll still be able to do very many useful things, uh, but you'll be missing some of the real beauty of the framework. Uh, and you may also, from time to time, scratch your head wondering why it's called middleware. Here are some more complex cases, and we can start to see uh, this uh, sandwich from the earlier slide emerging. Uh, we, have, uh, we have an endpoint at the start and at the finish of both of these columns, and we have middleware of all places in the, in the middle. And we have two ways on this slide of stacking middleware uh, as composable pieces coming together to form controller logic. And generally, the example on the left uh, is what I would recommend for how to put uh, different middleware together uh, into, uh, into controller logic. But there are some times where you might do uh, the thing on the right. Uh, just to review that in a little bit more depth, the, um, the pattern from the left of the previous slide, uh, I'll show in a little bit more detail here. We have one middleware which adds uh, the string hello world to uh, the message attribute of the rec object and then uh, calls next, which will mean that Express will then execute the next middleware in the stack, which then uses rec.message to send to the client with an HTTP response code of 200. Uh, so that's, that's the middleware stack, uh, and that will be important later. Enough about that. Um, I want to talk for a brief moment about testing behavior. Uh, and I know that there are a lot of um, analogies out there that are designed to try to help people understand the distinction between behavior and implementation. And we've had some uh, sometimes heated conversations here, even during WISE, about what is behavior and what is implementation. Um, and uh, I've often argued that the distinction is really relative to one's objective uh, and that it's necessarily the case when you're developing modular systems um, that your objective kind of dictates what's behavior and what's implementation. And I've been walking around saying things like one person's uh, uh, behavior is another person's implementation. Uh, but putting aside the kind of obscure uh, analogies and, and pithy aphorisms, I. I want to use an analogy that I think everyone can, can relate to, and that's the human heart. Uh, for my heart, I don't care if it's an artificial heart or a real heart, whether it's my own heart or someone else's that I've received as a transplant, as long as my organs continue to receive oxygenated blood, uh, I feel like I'm in good shape and I'm, I'm happy. And to me, that's the behavior of that organ in my body. Uh, whose heart it is or how it works is not really something that I concern myself with on a daily basis. And so that's what I think about when I'm trying to make the distinction between uh, behavior and implementation. And that's all that I will say um, about it at this point. The next thing that I think we have to address is whether or not express middleware is behavior. Uh, some of the conversations I've had about it with others, some people think that uh, that the endpoint is behavior, uh, and that simply hitting an endpoint with an HTTP request and asserting against the response body is enough to test behavior. Uh, but I, I, I think we can actually do better than that, and I think that the middleware that we're writing 
uh, is the real unit of behavior that we should be testing. And I can kind of make this case by looking at what middleware do. First of all, they define reusable components. And, and so that means that I can stack middleware together in unique combinations that service different endpoints. And the middleware that I write, in order to be sure that it works in all of those desired scenarios, uh, needs to be tested before I feel comfortable using it as a building block in controller logic. Secondly, middleware create, modify, and store uh, public variables. And by its nature, that's a very public-facing feature of middleware. And so whether you're using the ports and adapters analogy or, or you're looking at, at, at the human heart as the analogy or anything else that, that you find useful, uh, I think you have to agree that anything that provides for and modifies uh, public-facing objects and attributes of those objects um, is uh, providing uh, a kind of behavior. Thirdly, middleware can send responses to clients. And so by that same token, uh, I think we can make the argument that that is behavior as well. And lastly, very often, a suite of middleware will be um, uh, the basis for a node package on NPM. And I, I don't think anyone who does test-driven development would make the argument that uh, they should release an entire package to NPM uh, without writing tests. So I, I, I think we can say pretty safely that middleware uh, is behavior. And so that's kind of where, where we are. We, we've agreed that as a company we're committed to doing test-driven development. And we've concluded that the kind of test-driven development that we're doing is testing behavior. And we have just finished arriving at the conclusion that the middleware that we write and express is behavior. And yet, from what I've seen, I, I, I think that more developers could be using TDD when they write their express middleware. And so I have to ask the question about why that's not happening or why are we simply uh, you know, spawning up a server and testing against an endpoint uh, rather than pulling middleware as units uh, into, our, into our testing. And I think that the answer is that it can be very challenging to, to do this. And uh, this is especially so to newcomers to Node and Express and also newcomers to, to TDD. Uh, but some of these challenges are actually uh, somewhat hard to, to, to answer even for ex developers who I think are experienced uh, with, um, with all the technologies and, and with TDD. And so let's look at some, of, some examples of those challenges and explore kind of uh, how we might solve them. Uh, so one of the main approaches that I see uh, in blogs and, uh, and around the internet on how to test express middleware is with request, super agent, or super test, uh, or some library that is essentially um, what you would do is you would, you would spawn a server and then you would use the library to, to, to fire off an HTTP request. You wait uh, for that server to, uh, to respond uh, and then you can assert against, um, against that, the, the body of that response or against the, the status code of that response. How many of you think that uh, this kind of test is, is a good idea? Okay. Can, can you tell me why? Not to put you on the spot. But. Uh, well, I think, I think it, it tests the, what you're trying to achieve, which is yeah, a response from the server, right? Sure. It's pretty, pretty to the function of the application. Sure. So, so the, the response that the server generates is behavior, and, and, and testing it by seeing kind of what the server uh, sends back to us uh, would, be, um, would be a reasonable way of testing behavior, but let me ask the question, what happens if we, we add a new middleware to the stack? Like let's say that we, um, we use middleware to, to check, um, check credentials or see if someone is authorized to, to be viewing a particular resource. Then we have to go back and rewrite this test uh, to provide a, a username and password or to send a cookie in some way. Um, and so I think that if, if what you're developing is not under really heavy active development and you're not changing the middleware stack, 
this approach could work well, but you may also find that, uh, that your tests are breaking when you don't expect them to break. So this is a challenge. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, a lot of people do this, uh, but I, I do think that we can, do, we can do better than that. One reason for testing endpoints, though, is because we've had problems with endpoints sometimes just disappearing or becoming disabled. So we wanted to make sure that we had a suite that actually hit every endpoint just to make sure that there wasn't some problem with it just uh, going away. Sure, sure. So the, en the endpoints are, are also important to, to test because um, because if they go away, then obviously your application is not not behaving properly. We've done some endpoint tests on the um, on the Pony team, and what we have found is that um, they're expensive to maintain, um, and there's definitely value in knowing whether the endpoints are functioning. But um, we found that the, the cost benefit, at least for us, uh, has been it's been too expensive for what we've gotten out of it. Other teams may feel differently about it. Um, yeah. But this test also gives you those tests against your contract to make sure that your rest endpoints are returning what you're expecting. If you have more consumers in this study center, then that's kind of important. So this will give you your behavior plus your contract at the same time. That's true. Yeah. So uh, so absolutely. So um, there could be a lot of value in, in testing endpoints because it is um, it is a way that you can test whether you're you're fulfilling your contracts. Um, for our purposes, we found that it was too expensive. Uh, but it's reasonable. I just I just don't think that that this is going to go far enough. Uh, I, I certainly I would have a much harder argument saying that no one should test their endpoints. What I'm saying is that I think that there are some approaches that uh, that may be more satisfying. Uh, so I asked what happens if we add Miller Miller to the stack. Uh, good. So the next thing here, testing mid stack. Assuming assuming that we want to test middleware individually. Uh, we're going to end up testing something that looks like this, typically. At least judging by uh, a lot of the examples that I've seen, uh, people are defining middleware as anonymous functions uh, inside, of, uh, inside of a declaration of an endpoint. So the question would then arise, how are you going to test this middleware and assert against these functions individually? Uh, has anyone done anything like that? And how has anyone solved those problems? Or is everyone just testing, testing endpoints? Okay. What's up? Don't use anonymous functions. Yep. So that that is that is a solution. Uh, not using anonymous functions. Um, we tried something a little bit different on the Pony team at first, which was which was actually kind of a bad idea that I'd come up with, uh, which was to find where Express attaches these anonymous functions to to the Express router. And pulling them back out and, and testing them that way, uh, we found that was actually very uh, dependent on Express implementation. And if we ever up upgraded Express, uh, we might find ourselves uh, in a bad position. So yeah, I'd say pulling these uh, pulling these out in some way or not making them anonymous functions uh, is probably uh, the way to to go here. Uh, assuming that we take the latter approach there, and we pull them out. Uh, we can then require them into our test the same way that we required them into our endpoints. So if you're defining, uh, if you define your middleware in a separate module, and you're just kind of like uh, requiring the, the, the requiring an object with a set of functions into your, uh, into your endpoint, and then just kind of like lining them up so that you, you can pass them by reference into your endpoint, you can also require that same middleware into your test. And I'll show some more examples of that. Um, but the issue here that you might have is that fundamentally when you're testing middleware, you're really testing one of, of five things. You're testing whether something got added, removed, or, or modified on rec, uh, whether that happened to, to rest, uh, whether some method on rec got called or some method on rest got called or whether next was called. Those are really the five things that you could be testing uh, in Express Middleware. And if you assume for a moment that it's the last of those and you want to test whether next is called, uh, then uh, you could just pass a function anonymously into your middleware as next in your test. And um, that would work as long as next is called. But if next never gets called, then you're going to end up with a fairly um, 
uh, poor test failure. Your test is just going to time out in this case. Uh, looking at this example uh, where it says done, if you had a line in between, uh, in between the middleware and done that, that ran an assertion, that assertion would never get run if next uh, is not called. And instead, what's going to happen is your, your test is just going to time out. Um, that can be pretty frustrating, uh, especially if it's right before a demo. The next, um, next thing that you might do is rather than testing that next is called, you might actually want to test that your middleware added something to, to rec or res. So in this case, I'm running an assertion to test whether or not uh, foo was added to rec and whether it has the, the value bar. I'm uh, expecting my middleware to do that. Uh, does anyone see any issues with, with this code? What's up? You didn't give it a next object to call. Next yeah, so I didn't give it a next, and as a result, I don't really know when I'm running this assertion. Uh, You're running it before it's actually done, right? Exactly. So I've created a race condition in all of my tests, and um, I may never notice it uh, when I'm developing on my laptop, but it may show up for the first time uh, on Jenkins, uh, which can be pretty frustrating uh, and hard to debug. Uh, that's another issue here. That's a bug in my slide. You have to call done. Uh, we didn't do that here. Um, testing with data is another challenge that I, I, I see a lot of people uh, have a hard time with. Uh, where is data going to come from? Uh, how are we going to get data to move uh, with the repository so we don't have to like set up uh, the correct data in a Mongo instance as a dependency for our, our, our test framework? Uh, test pollution is another thing. Uh, if we have data in a Mongo instance and um, and we are, one of our tests updates the data, and then we have a, a test later on in the in, in our testing that uh, that asserts against some response and expects the data to be in its original state, uh, we're going to have issues here. You could try after each test to to correct the data and bring it back to its initial state, but you're kind of assuming in that case that um, that you know exactly how your middleware is going to function and what data it's going to modify and how it's going to modify that data. So that's another issue that you might face. Those are at least some of the challenges that we faced uh, when we started to, to, to write tests for our express middleware. Uh, mocking dependencies, uh, similar example, uh, you know, the, that connection may not always be available. It may change. We don't want that to break our tests, so we're going to have to mock um, mock a third-party resource uh, in some way for something like that. Another challenging example. I want to shift gears a little bit. Those those are some of the challenges that we faced. I want to talk a little bit about the promises um, about about QJS and and the promise libraries. The reason being that our solution um, for those challenges that we just reviewed uh, relies very heavily on on promises. And so I, I think just doing a little bit of review here uh, would probably help. <laughs> uh, this is my definition of what a promise is. Uh, I think some people may have some disagreement about some of the words that I, I chose. I'm not a not a, a, a CS guy, so um, I did my best here. Uh, I see a promise as, as a delegate for an asynchronous action that collects references to callbacks, which are then called under a number of circumstances, maintains a state, and provides a mechanism for chaining. Uh, for me, at least, that's that's been the definition that's helped me to understand the, the library and how to make the most of it. Uh, looking briefly at how that works, if my promise returns a promise, I can attach callbacks for uh, when the promise reaches different states of resolution. Promise itself is going to call one set of callbacks uh, uh, when it's resolved, and that's the ones that I've, I supply uh, with the then, uh, call to then. Uh, another set uh, under errors, that's the catch, and a third set uh, under all circumstances, as long as the, the promise is, is resolved. And um, and I'm calling done to end my promise chain. A little bit more on that later on. Uh, I've forgotten that I had done a little animation here. On the flip side, uh, we'll see that the developer who has created the promise has to define uh, when the action is completed successfully and when it hasn't. So 
Uh, this example is fairly basic, but uh, you can imagine like an IO action or reaching out to some third party resource uh, and resolving the promise uh, under condition, in this case, under condition X is if the action was successful uh, and otherwise you're going to reject uh, with an error uh, that you can catch. And so uh, when you resolve, that's going to uh, trigger the callbacks that you passed in on then. Uh, when you reject, you're going to pass an error to the callbacks that you've added with catch. And kind of putting that all together, um, we can see that that what I just said is uh, represented graphically there. Uh, in the life of a promise, uh, it's going to go from pending, it's either going to be fulfilled or rejected. If it's fulfilled, then uh, the then callbacks and the finally callbacks are called. If it's rejected, the catch callbacks and the finally callbacks are, are called. Uh, and a promise is going to move only along one of those two paths. Uh, and once it's uh, in one of the states on the right, it's going to stay there. Uh, for the life of the promise. Promises can be chained. Uh, so everything here on the right side of the slide uh, generates a promise. Everything in the middle, when you call then or catch or finally, it's going to return a new promise. And done is going to end the chain. Uh, it doesn't actually return uh, a promise. And so what that looks like in practice uh, is you might have this, uh, this chain of promises, each one of which is going to return a new promise until you end uh, end your promise chain. Something that took me uh, a long time to, to realize is uh, that if you, it, it's very easy to break your promise chains. Any time that you declare a promise, you should either return it or call done on it. Otherwise, what might happen is there are errors that might get thrown along the way that uh, don't bubble up and aren't handled, and your user could be left hanging, wondering what's going on because the promise is pending uh, basically until the user gives up. Uh, so don't do that. And the rule that, uh, that I use is I say, I always call, I always return a promise or I call done. That's really kind of the end of the story for me. Uh, some people would say there are some exceptions, uh, but I would say just don't forget to handle your errors. Uh, if you have to use try and catch, do that uh, somewhere in your application. Uh, but it's not an excuse to not call done, uh, at least the way I see it. So now let's talk about. Um, Before you go on. Yep. Um, done is only provided in the Q library, but not in the Angular's library. So a lot of us, most of us probably here don't know what the Q library and are more familiar with the Angular right? Yes. Yeah, that's right. So. Um, so I, I can't speak to uh, to what the substitute would be in the Angular context, uh, but that's true. If you're familiar with the Angular library, you've not seen done. Uh, if you try calling done with the Angular's promise library, uh, it's going to throw an error. Uh, so uh, this is purely in the context of, um, of server-side code, and particularly with Q, um, though I think that any uh, promises A plus compliant uh, promise solution will, will excuse me, will implement a done function. Uh, any other questions on the stuff that we've covered so far? Are we pretty good? Okay. So um, this is this is a um, this is a depiction of the first uttering of the word Eureka, and this is this is um, this is Archimedes when he realized that uh, you could measure the volume of irregular objects uh, by the displacement of fluid. It had previously been a very difficult problem before that time, and while the development of our pattern on the Pony team is not anywhere near as profound as the first time that volume was measured by displacement. Uh, it did cause me to have kind of a eureka moment because a lot of the challenges that we were dealing with uh, were solved uh, by using Q more closely with Express Middleware. And I'll kind of show what I mean by that. If we uh, are to start building a pattern here for how to test uh, Express Middleware, I should just start by saying that every example that you'll see online for how to use Express, or, or virtually every example is going to be wrong in, in some way. Uh, they'll work, but they're kind of designed to simplify the, the, the code in the examples and, and to make it easy for the reader to understand a particular uh, principle that they're demonstrating. But I would say they're probably not good practice uh, in terms of how to structure a production-ready application. In fact, most of the examples on the Express uh, ExpressJS website don't even use semicolons. So 
uh, there are a lot of issues that you might encounter if you're just going to run with those examples. So I want to, to, to take really some prototypical examples from how people structure their express code online and run it through these five steps and end up with a better organization for an express application and what I think would be a, a really robust uh, testing framework. And so throughout these slides, you'll actually see uh, I made a lot of references to kind of an old paradigm and a new paradigm. The old paradigm is, uh, it's old to me because it's kind of what I started with when I learned Express and I went through tutorials uh, and I kind of learned by examples. I kind of learned this way of doing things as I think a lot of people have. Uh, and I want to try to, to, to move us away from that. And so you'll see references to an old paradigm and a new paradigm. In the kind of old paradigm, old paradigm, the examples that you'll see uh, floating around, uh, people start with an endpoint. They'll include their middleware as a set of anonymous functions. And when they go to test that, they'll pull the entire endpoint into their test, uh, really by firing up a server and, and requesting against that. And I think that the first step to making express code more testable and readable is to pull the middleware out into a separate file. So all each of those anonymous functions that you've defined in your endpoint as a middleware, what I would like to see is I'd like to see each of those as a method on an object that you make available in a separate file that you require in. Because if you do that, you can actually pull those middleware into your endpoint and you can pull them into your tests individually. Here's how that would look. It, yeah. Sorry, I was also ask, it, Please. Also yeah, absolutely. So, so the question is, is it better for for code reuse as well? And and the answer is yes, because if you if you're just declaring your anonymous functions in line in your endpoint declaration, you actually have zero possibility to reuse that code anywhere. Um, if you're pulling them out into a separate file, then that opens up the, the door to, to code reuse. Uh, and there, you may encounter some issues with how far you can take that, depending on how you structure the code in your middleware. Uh, but without that step, there's, there's really no ability to do that at all. So this is kind of how we move away from, from that. If we look at the code, we go from having the middleware defined as anonymous functions on the top which we pass to app.get or app.post or, or however you've declared your, your endpoint. And we're putting them in a separate object. Now, for the purpose of this example, I've kind of declared that object in line in the code, but I would recommend that really the only way you'll get code reuse out of this is by pulling that object into a separate file and requiring it in. Uh, but once you do that, then you can just, when you call app.get, you can pass a reference to each of those methods in as, as a middleware function. We still can't quite test our middleware, though, because uh, if we look at those examples, uh, we're still going to have to to pass rec and res uh, to that middleware function. And without doing that, uh, without having something to pass, uh, like we would normally get by making an HTTP request, uh, we're not really going to uh, be able to run uh, run the middleware and have it do anything. So uh, the next step is to mock rec and res. Uh, we need a way to call the middleware directly in our in our in our tests, um, and um, and and there are a couple of modules that can help you do that by mocking rec and res. You can roll your own if you want. Uh, the examples in these slides use Node mocks HTTP. It's a it's a module that just provides basic rec and res mocking. If you want something more specific to Express, you can use Express Mocks HTTP. And I'll pass around these slides afterwards. So if you want the names of the modules or the URLs, we can um, we can distribute that. Uh, and I found that that these modules have both been been really useful to me. In the code, uh, we can see what that looks like. Uh, we've gone from uh, from making a request against a uh, against a URL endpoint. Uh, to uh, writing mocks with this uh, with this node mocks HTTP library, and then we can just pass those mocked rec and rest objects in when we call our middleware function, and we can assert against the result. 
we're still not quite able to test because we still have race conditions. We don't know when our middleware has finished async actions. Uh, we need to know when it's finished because otherwise we might be asserting before it's done. And to do that, I, I think really probably the best solution here is to use promises. Uh, and if we use promises as the link between middleware and endpoints, and also as the link between our middleware and tests, then we're going to be able to delay execution of our assertions in our testing until our promises are resolved. So I use Q, which is why I've, I've brought the logo in there. Uh, it's just what I'm used to using. It's feature complete. Uh, it's promises A plus compliant. I see a lot of people are using that. There's no inherent reason why you have to use Q. Uh, any promise implementation should work. Uh, and if we look at what we can do with the code under that circumstance, uh, we can, uh, in, the, in the old paradigm, we've just defined our middleware and we've called rest.json or rest.send uh, or next uh, when our asynchronous actions complete. And we're I would recommend changing that so you're you're defining a promise and you're either resolving or rejecting a promise when your IO or, or any uh, requests of third-party resources um, uh, have completed and then you return that promise. What you can do as a result of that is you can return the client-server interaction to the endpoint. So, you can take a call to rest.json out of your middleware and put it back into your endpoint and just leave the middleware responsible for, for the business logic. So this should should um, should please the uh, probably Java developers and, and people who are fans of, of separating business logic from presentation uh, because under the old paradigm, you're saying that you're gonna pass rec and rest to your middleware and your middleware is gonna reach out to the client directly. There's really no separation of concerns at all uh, I would recommend uh, you can pass rec and rest to your middleware, uh, let it resolve a promise, and then when that promise resolves, you can have your endpoint send communication to the client. And taking that kind of out of the abstract and looking at some examples of code, in the top, what we would be doing is just kind of passing our middleware functions uh, in as um, as, um, as composable pieces of our endpoint, and then just kind of like letting it decide when it communicates uh, with clients. And if we move away from that, we can call our middleware, wait for, uh, wait for the promise that it returns to resolve. And then if we look, it's one, two, three, four, it's like five, five lines in on, that, on the new paradigm. Uh, when the promise resolves, we can call next, or in that second anonymous function, when the promise resolves, actually it's the same thing we can call next, but uh, if there's an error, we can call, call rest.json. So we can leave that responsibility in the endpoint. The issue with doing that is that your, your test framework is gonna get, uh, yes? Why would you, if you're gonna do that, why would you pass the response object to the middleware? Yeah, okay, so uh, that's an excellent question. So why would you pass the response object to middleware uh, if you're going to go this far to, to, to separate concerns? And, and I imagine that your question would apply to rec as well, though it might be a little bit more apparent. If there's data on rec, um, that would be an easy answer to why you pack, uh, pass rec uh, to your middleware. But your middleware might uh, do something like define a function on rest. Uh, I've used uh, a framework that I've used for Express uh, Sales.js defines a lot of convenience functions on REST. It provides middleware that defines like a, a, a REST, dot, uh, REST dot server error function that, that, that sends a 500 response to the client. Uh, so you might actually be adding things to REST uh, as well. Uh, but certainly the, the question is a valid one because we're going so far as to separate our business logic from interaction with the client from our, from our presentation. So, why wouldn't we just keep rec and rest out of the picture entirely? And it's a legitimate question. Uh, what I can tell you is that for me, I've kind of settled on the fact that everything that I write in terms of middleware uh, here and, and probably elsewhere is gonna be for Express. And so I'm confident knowing that rec and rest are gonna be available to me. And I don't personally feel the need to be more verbose and, and and avoid passing rec and rest directly into my middleware. But uh, if you really are trying to make a very firm uh, distinction between presentation and business logic, 
then you probably want to pull arguments off of rec and rest and, and pass um, pass a, a different object into your middleware. And then your middleware would, would, would certainly be more um, more reusable in that case. Any other questions on that? There'd be a case too, right? When the promise is resolved, that data could be then uh, passed into that uh, anonymous function when you're there. So that you actually return, it does some lot, the middleware performs some work and then actually returns an object as part of uh, the promise resolving. Yes. And that could be then used within the next function, let's say, or something, something else. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so rather than um, uh, like right now in this example, your your middleware could resolve with nothing. It could it could resolve with no no arguments, and it wouldn't matter. The fact that it resolved is all that we're really looking at in this example to see uh, whether we should uh, should call next or respond to the client with some error message. Uh, but you're right. If you're going to to pull a separate, uh, if you're going to put a separate object together. Uh, with elements of rec and rest uh, and pass that to your middleware, then yeah, then you probably would want to resolve with something that you're going to mix back in with rec uh, or do something with uh, in your endpoint. And so, yeah, there are definitely, you, you could build on this and make it more verbose. If separation of concerns is, is really your, your forte, uh, there are, are, there's definitely room to, to improve on this pattern. So the issue that um, that you may encounter if you if you're to go through all of these steps is that writing your tests are still going to be kind of awkward. Um, you're probably going to pull your middleware into your test uh, and use the syntax of uh, of promises to decide when to assert. Uh, I think there's probably a better way than that. Um, if you use the uh, the new async syntax that Mocha's made available since 1.18, um, you can actually uh, you can return a, a promise to Mocha, and Mocha will know whether it is uh, resolved or, or rejected. Um, if you are using an, a version earlier than 1.18, there's a Mocha as promised uh, library that you can use if you can't upgrade for whatever reason. Uh, the other thing is that I would say we should be using Chai, and we should be using uh, Chai is promised, which is a Chai plugin that makes it really easy to assert against uh, against promises. And we'll take a look at what that would look like in code. So the top is if you were just going to use uh, the syntax of promises. And so we have this um, comment uh, about a little more than halfway down, assert here. That's where you'd write your your expect or or, um, or your shoulds or however you're doing assertions. Uh, with chai or or otherwise, and you're kind of doing that inside of an anonymous function that you're passing to to then. It's a little awkward. It gets even weirder when you're passing the mocha done function to finally, and then you're calling uh, you're calling the promise promises done after that. It looks weird. It's hard to read. And for people who aren't uh, familiar with what you're doing, who are coming into this uh, for the first time, they're going to be very confused. Uh, it's even a little debatable about exactly where you would call done. Would you call it at the end of your the function that you're passing to then, or would you pass it in as a reference to finally? Um, and that example doesn't even actually catch all possible test failures because you could have a scenario where uh, it, it, if your test, if, if your middleware is going to resolve with a value other than what you expect, then you'll catch that in your assertion. But if your middleware ends up rejecting and you don't expect that, then what happens is the anonymous function that you pass to them, which is where your assertions are located, that's not even going to run. And so you're just going to get the call to finally, and your test is going to complete without running any assertions. So you could kind of work around that by writing a catch block, which just throws an error. You wouldn't even have an assertion, just throw an error. If it runs, it, it throws an error. But that's really kind of, uh, it, it gets more and more bizarre the, the, the better you try to make it. Um, using chai as promised in the bottom, we can see we just return the expectation, mm -hmm. and chai as promised makes a bunch of new assertions available for promises uh, with the eventually keyword. And so I'm saying I, I'm expecting that that promise is going to eventually resolve uh, with the string uh, value. So we've looked at each of the uh, elements in isolation. And I want to kind of build the whole uh, picture 
uh, for what this would look like and an example application. So we have here is an example endpoint with the pattern that I've, that I've uh, been demonstrating. And in the top, we have the first three lines kind of pull that middleware into the endpoint. We're requiring a, a file that uh, exports an object with, uh, with a middleware function. Or actually, in this case, it just exports a middleware function. And uh, we're calling that as uh, the first line of executing the, the anonymous function that we passed to our endpoint. And then we're returning the client server interaction to the endpoint by uh, wiring up different things on REST or calling next uh, to the promise resolution and rejection. And finally, you'll call done. You could wrap that whole thing in a try catch block. I, th I think some people might be concerned that calling done and having an unhandled error um, would, uh, would potentially crash your application. And so you might wrap that whole call to your middleware function inside of, uh, of a try catch block if, if that's something that you're particularly concerned about. Uh, but that's the endpoint. In the middleware itself, I would recommend uh, requiring the queue library and returning a promise. And then you would just do whatever, whatever it is that you're going to do in your middleware, whether it's writing to the, the database or some other async action. You do that, and when that completes successfully, you resolve your promise. If it rejects, or if it if it completes unsuccessfully or doesn't complete, you reject your promise. And then finally, here's a set of tests that can use that pattern. And so, um, these are animating out of order, but uh, I'm actually not even showing up. So. In the yellow, the first thing we're doing is we're pulling that middleware into our test. It's the same thing we did with our endpoint. We're just requiring that middleware function. And then we're mocking rec and res. We're just using the, the node mocks HTTP library. You might want to use express mocks HTTP if your needs are a little bit different. And then we are uh, we're using promises with Mocha by returning the expectation and using Chaya's promise to say that we expect that that promise is going to be fulfilled, and then we can actually assert against anything on rec or res uh, right where that comment is. And in a test where we're expecting that the promise is going to reject, uh, we can say that we expect that that, uh, that promise is going to be rejected with, and then you can pass in the string that is uh, the error message in your error object. And so these tests become actually fairly easy to write once you're familiar with the pattern. And you know exactly when your middleware is finished. Um, and you're testing each middleware behavior in isolation without needing to fire up a server and without needing to, to hit endpoints um, with an HTTP request. Sure. Yep. Um, using Chaya's promise, when you're testing a fulfillment of promises, is there a timeout involved or if it never actually resolves, is your test So any, that's, that's a great question. So. Yep. Is, is, there, is there a timeout involved when using Chai as promised uh, with Mocha? Uh, and the answer is yes, because any time that you're using uh, Mocha with, uh, with an asynchronous syntax, you can specify what, what the timeout is. So it is still possible for, uh, for your tests to time out. But the only reason that I could think of why that would happen is if you've broken your promise chain somewhere. Uh, otherwise, what's going to happen is uh, an uncaught error is going to be thrown. Uh, and because in the Mocha framework, a thrown error is a failed assertion, uh, your test is going to fail, and it's going to specifically tell you what error you got. So the last piece of what I want to talk about here, um, and it's good because we're almost out of time, is testing with data. And so we faced a lot of challenges testing with data because uh, we needed something that uh, that didn't depend on the environment, so we didn't want to have to make sure that that Mongoose was available. Uh, we didn't want to have to make sure that our uh, that our Mongo instance uh, had the data in it that we were expecting to use in our tests. We wanted to be able to define data that traveled with the repo, and we wanted to make sure that we could easily reset the data to an initial state. And the problem uh, I found could be solved by using a library called MockGoose. And so if you're using MongoDB with MongoDB, if that's the, the, um, the, 
the, the set of frameworks that you're using, uh, you can use Mongoose very easily uh, to, to mock uh, your Mongoose instance so that it never actually connects with a live Mongo instance. Uh, if you're not using Mongoose, there are some other setups that are available, and you can also probably roll your own. And using Mongoose is actually fairly simple. You're just going to require Mongoose as you normally would. You require Mongoose, and then you pass your Mongoose instance to Mongoose, and it actually is going to monkey patch uh, Mongoose so that it never actually connects with your with your instance. And it's going to provide some convenience functions for managing uh, uh, test pollution, so you can easily reset your data to an initial state. The other thing to keep in mind about, about Mongoose is that uh, you're actually using uh, memory rather than the disk, so you might actually see a performance boost uh, with that as well. Lastly, uh, you'll need to code your data into fixtures. And so if you put your data into JSON or into uh, a JavaScript object literal or, or array literal uh, that you export, uh, you can require that data in uh, to a place where you're going to load that into, you could load it into Mongo with Mongoose or you could load it into, into your mocked uh, database uh, with Mongoose. Uh, and you can actually do that very easily with a library called uh, Mongoose Fixtures. And so here I'm just requiring the data that I had defined in the previous slide in users.js. Uh, and before each of my tests, uh, I'm using that, that, uh, that Mongoose Fixtures library to load the users into the database from scratch. And then I can build my tests from there. And so that's, um, that's all that I wanted to talk about. I know that's kind of a lot of information in an hour. Uh, but I'm happy to make an attempt at answering questions in the next five minutes if there are any. Anybody? Yeah. I have one. Yeah. Cooper. Please. Okay. Um, say just just for instance that maybe the Express team decided to quit today and you need to switch frameworks to socket IO or something like that. How much changes would you need to do both in your code and in your testing harness in order to do the switch? And what would you do to guarantee that you get the same results? Yeah, so that's a great question. I I can't give you a definitive answer off the top of my head. I think if I were able to do that, that would be pretty amazing. Uh, but I can tell you that um, I think you're going to face at least some of the same issues uh, with another framework that you face right now doing tests with Express, uh, namely uh, making sure that you're asserting at the right time, managing your data, getting it to travel with the repo, uh, and um, also uh, 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 testing your behavior in individual units. Uh, and so there, you may have to take some of the separations that, uh, that we've implemented in our pattern uh, and, and really do full uh, separation uh, uh, and, you know, between your presentation, your business logic. Um, I, I don't know if, if, um, if Socket.io makes a rec and rest object available. Um, so you may have some issues there. Uh, but I would think that this would be a good start for you uh, as you're going about that process. Any other questions? Yeah, so I'm just going to follow up to Vince's question earlier. He asked about timeouts. Um, and you mentioned how you could explicitly deploy how much time before it times out. And then you made a comment that, well, you shouldn't have to worry about that as long as you use deploys. Resolve or reject your promise. Returned your promise or called right. done. Right. Yep. Exactly. So no, no uh, broken promises. That's right. So I guess, is there a case where if, so I guess I don't, I'm not fully clear on what the time is actually doing, <clears throat> but if before that promise is resolved, let's say it never, for some reason it never, it time, it never resolves, it times out. So it never rejects data or results. What's the done with this? Is it no that it how does it go? Mm. Does that make sense for the whole country? Yeah, so if 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 you're if you're I it's my understanding that if your promise chain is broken, then the done on your promise chain will not get called and it, it does nothing. 
but as long as you're always returning a promise, it will eventually get to done. And what done will do is it will throw any errors that were not previously caught in a catch block in your promise chain. Handle the error called that because it's Excuse me, yes, handled with an error callback. Any unhandled errors get raised as actual exceptions now. The problem with that is so I'm just more not doing this with that is it now throws an exception which then crashes your node server, which means you lose state for any other requests that are in progress. So you basically host anyone else who's not on that server. You don't have to start to restart it, so it'll recover instantly, but you'll drop a couple of requests. Yeah, use, use, use upstart or forever uh, or some solution like that, but also it's probably a good idea to put your middleware in a, in a, in a try-catch block because absolutely you can lose state when done is called and error is thrown. Uh, you don't want that to be the, the, the end of your execution. But to clarify, so you're saying that you really shouldn't have to worry about the timeouts as long as you have your process. Yeah, that's been my, my experience. Uh, it can be frustrating because there is still a test failure mode with, with timeouts when you have accidentally broken your, your promise chain. Uh, so that could be a type of error that your test framework might pick up, um, but it's only going to pick that up with a timeout. Can I add one more thing to the done comment? Please. The thing that done solves is if you lazily don't define your error callback, what happens is you're just still hanging, right? So if you like encounter an error and then you don't ever handle it, then you'll just never write the response. So that's a really bad user experience. So what calling done does is forces something to happen in that case. So it doesn't just hang when you have to handle an error. It, it will it'll crash the server. If you, but if you call done, it'll at least crash the server rather than just do nothing. Um, so it kind of forces it to bubble up the top. So you see the issue. Yeah, so, so that's, that's actually a very good point, uh, is that uh, if you don't call done, uh, then you may have errors that are not thrown. Uh, which I'd, I'd say is is an even worse position to be in than having your app crash. Uh, but obviously, you want to catch those errors and handle them. And then, if you actually do that, if you if you're catching those errors, what you end up with is being able to handle errors in one place in your application rather than each um, each segment of your promise chain having to have its own own catch block. I think you might have one other question. Other questions? Yeah, um, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned about how testing just the endpoints is very problematic. But um, I was wondering if you um, maybe, you know, you had some examples where you had several different pieces of middleware working together. And if you, if on your team you experimented maybe taking like that, um, that sequence of different middlewares out and extracting that and testing that like all as one piece. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So um, what I can tell you is that we, when when I started on the team, we were writing one middleware per endpoint, uh, and the way that we were composing our our middleware logic was was just by putting putting blocks of code together inside of that function, um, and I really wanted to take advantage of the the middleware stack. Uh, and, and the workflow that Express makes available. So we moved to, to, to using multiple middleware uh, per endpoint. Uh, I haven't tried, uh, since then, I haven't tried testing um, multiple middleware together because I think that the, the logical place to, to, to divide behavioral units is each middleware function. Um, but I, I suppose that that could be important in some circumstances because there are middleware out there uh, that make attributes available on REC that other middleware would then need. And so you're not going to pick up uh, uh, a failure uh, in the integration of those units. Um, it's probably the best I can do to answer the question. Anything else? Okay, so the last, just the last thing that I want to say. Uh, is that uh, this is this is very much a work in progress for me uh, and, and and for the team, and so if, 
if you start experimenting with this and you feel like there are shortcomings to this, I really, really want to hear uh, from you uh, because ultimately we want to come up with the best pattern that we can. Uh, so please let me know uh, after Friday, let my team know. Yes. My biggest issue with your pattern is you don't actually construct middleware. You use them inside of the middleware. The anonymous function is the middleware. Mm. And you actually don't. Because the middleware has the rec, res, and next array. Right. So that's the middleware definitions. Right. While you don't actually do that. So that's right. my biggest concern. Right. So, so we might be able to improve the pattern by not calling it middleware. Um, but I, I still think it's important to have a separation there. But but I, I do see your point that other developers coming onto the project might be confused that it's not that's not actually the middleware in, in Express Lingo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you.